Okay, guys, uh, we're going to get going now. So welcome to tonight's session. So this is basically class one, I think, of the eight classes we have. Um, so today we will do um, today we'll do valuations. Tomorrow on Sunday we'll do the second class on valuations, um, and then next week we will do consolidations. So next week, the two classes next week will do consolidations. In the following week, we will do I think it's the June exam, um, and then that weekend. Um, I think Justin requested that we have like a mock exam. Then, we, then uh, basically, you will just write in that time, the Saturday and the Sunday. If you available, you should be available based on the timetable, and then I'll I'll, I'll look through it. Um, but what's important if you can send me? So Justin, you just need to send me the June exam, and then we need to get a full exam, pass exam that we can do that you can write on. Okay, so for today and on Sunday, we'll do valuations. So um, I'm going to see, we'll see how far we get to valuations questions today. But we're just basically going to, the structure will be, we're going to read through the scenario, identify important aspects, and then on site immediately. Um, we're not going to spend so much on theory because you want more, so, more um, practice of actual questions. Okay. So I'm going to switch my screen and then we're going to read through the scenario um, and then we will go straight into answering the question. Okay. Okay, so you should be able to see uh, my screen. So this is your hundred mark question. Um, so one of the pass. Okay, so we're gonna read this scenario. You can see it's quite a lengthy scenario. So it's how many pages? So we're gonna read through some of this. We're gonna read through everything. We're going to read through the ones that is important. So up until over here. Okay, so we'll read up until valuation. Um, we're not going to read through the financing and so forth. We're not going to read through financing. Uh, we're not going to read through this. Okay, so we'll just read up until the valuation. We're going to read the expansion and the valuation. Okay, so just take note. Okay, so we won't read this information on the chickens as well, because it's not going to be applicable to us. So just to get the background of the company, so they say, Salina Zimbabwe Private Limited is an integrated poultry operations and supplier of web breeding stock, hatching eggs, broiler and layer day old chicks. Selina also produces high quality table eggs and frozen chicken for both Zimbabwe and countries in the region. Selina has been producing chicken in Southern Africa since, since the 1950s. The company has grown from operating from a single room in a house to produce over 1.5 million day old, 1.5 million day-old chicks per week across Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Botswana. With roots in Zimbabwe, Selina has expanded to cater for Africa's growing appetite for the finest poultry products. Today, Selina's reach extends to over 20 countries across Africa, supplying local industries with web broilers, nutritional products, animal health products, equipment, and technical support. Furthermore, wherever Selina works, it works to uplift communities. Selina currently offers a wide range of poultry products, namely eggs, whole birds, mixed portions, special cuts, um, offals, and pet food. Okay, so generally a, a paragraph like this. So generally a paragraph like this helps you with a topic on um, risk management. Um, it will all, can also give you some idea of their strategy, okay? So 
an introduction paragraph like this will generally help you with strategy, risk management, and governance. Okay, so this is mainly going to help you with strategy and risk management. So just take note of that. Okay, so they say um, Rural Women Empowerment Project, an international non-governmental organization has um, invited Selena and some of its major competitors to submit applications to partner with it in a project that is intended to empower rural women in all rural districts in, in Zimbabwe. Over the past two years, the non-governmental -gov organization has trained 30,000 women from disadvantaged communities in the rearing of poultry as an income generating project. In order to ensure that the women kickstart the project, the organization wants to provide startup capital to all the women trained. The startup capital is in the form of 100 day old chicks for each trained participant. In this regard, it has invited tenders for the supply of 3 million day old chicks to the women over a period of six months. The government is excited about the NGO's initiative as it, as it is aligned to the economic blueprint, Zim Asset. Government has promised to offer tax incentives to the winner. The board of directors of Selena wants to win this tender, although they are aware that competition will be stiff on this project. They therefore want to produce their best quote by using relevant costing techniques. The management accountant who was developing this quotation was dismissed due to misconduct and you have been asked to carry on with this work. Information that has been gathered by the management accountant is detailed below. Okay, so this is for that, um, that relevant costing question. This is for question one. We're not dealing with that, so I'm skipping it. And we're going to go into the expansion. Okay, so we're just going to read up the expansion until the valuation notes, and then we will jump into answering the question. So they say, in pursuit of a growth strategy, the management of Selena decided to spread their risk by acquiring uh, Akinto Limited, a Nigerian based business which specializes in the manufacturing of baby food. Okay, very different. The management of Selena saw this as an opportunity to use their nutritional expertise in a new market. Akinto is currently not very profitable, but Selena's management carried out a due diligence exercise which revealed inefficiencies in the production system due to obsolete machinery, lack of clear competitive strategy, and a poor distribution channel as the main reason for the losses. An 80% stake would be purchased in a Kinto by Selena and a clear competitive strategy would be set. So up until here, so here you can understand over there, um, they're giving the rationale as to why uh, um, joining, as to why acquiring this company, as to why acquiring this company makes strategic sense, okay? So remember, you can expand in two ways. You can expand organically, or you can expand inorganically. Inorganically is by doing mergers and acquisitions. Okay, so it's an acquisition or a merger. So this is an inorganic um, expansion. So when you, um, I don't know how, what's the law in Zimbabwe, but yeah, like in South Africa, when you want to do a merger and acquisition, you, 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 um, the, the board needs to seek approval from the shareholders. So generally, I thought you have to have, have a rationale as to why it makes sense for the shareholders to accept the proposal. So generally, this over here, that, that blue highlights over there, that um, gives you the rationale as to why this makes strategic sense, at least from the director's point of view. Okay, the next thing to take note, they're telling you an 80% um, an stake would be present would be purchased in a quinto by Selena, and a clear competitive strategy would be set. This eighty percent stake means a majority interest is being acquired. So when you have a majority interest, you will generally use so valuation. If you have a, if you acquire a majority interest, you will generally use the free cash flow method as your valuation method. Okay, so just take note of that. 
Selena decided that the current distribution channels would be used for the baby food and, and that and they could maintain the name Akinto. It was agreed that the first step in, re in reviving Akinto would be to have a superior value chain that eliminates, that eliminates or reduces non-value adding activities, thus lowering production costs, which will translate into reduced prices, which in turn will appeal to a broad range of customers. Research done indicated that the baby food market has price sensitive buyers. However, it is important not to produce at low costs at the expense of healthy nutrients that mothers consider essential. A product that is too basic can be considered by customers as not offering the requisite value, even though it is very cheap. The baby food market is characterized by strong price competition, identical products that are readily available and a low switching costs between products and between competitors. The research also showed that the cost cutting approach could be easily copied by competitors. Thus the cost advantage needs to be sustainable. So this over here will help you with the risk question. Okay, so you have to use this to discuss the risks of this whole acquisition and so forth. Okay, so from the initial discussion, the shareholders of a kinder have expressed willingness to sell if the offer is $3 million for the 80% shareholding stake. In order to complete the valuation of, of Akinto, its management has provided the most recent financial statements, which are presented below. So here you can see they will sell 80% to Selena if Selena pays him $3 million. So obviously what Selena is going to have to work out whether $3 million is worth it. Okay. So here we're giving the income statement. So we have um, July 31, July 2015, 31, July 2016. This is in Nigerian Nigro. <coughs> okay, so these are all in rand thousands. Okay, so there we have gross profit. Then we have operating income, depreciation, operating leases other operating expenses, then we have operating profit, okay, then we have investment income, finance costs, then we have profit before tax, then we have income tax, then we have profit for the year. Okay, then we have some balance sheet. So we have property, plant and equipment, investment property, investment deferred tax, then we have inventories, trade and other receivables, cash and cash equivalents. Then we have ordinary share capital and premium, and then we have distributable reserves. Okay, then we have some other stuff there. Okay, so okay, so let's go on to the valuation notes. So the valuation notes and assumptions, all figures are in thousands of dollars. Revenue will be from the sale of baby food. Revenue is forecast to increase um, due to the turnaround strategies to be introduced by Selena. In real terms, revenue is expected to grow at 6%, while food inflation is expected to be 8% for the next five years. Thereafter, a nominal growth of 4% um, is expected. Cost of sales percentage is expected to remain unchanged. Okay. They say other non-operating income relates to rental income from the warehouse in the Abuho industrial area, which Akinto rents out. The average rent yield in this area is 15%. Depreciation has been calculated on the current depreciation policy determined by I-16 and I-38. Depreciation to sales ratio is expected to remain constant over the forecast period. Management expects depreciation and amortization to equal asset replacement costs. Operating leases relates to, to lease of storage warehouses in Bono and Inugu. The leasing company belongs to the current shareholders 
and the lease costs are 20% below the market rates. Market rates. The lease expires in two years' time and will likely and will like and will likely to be renewed at market rates. The contracts provide for lease escalation at the current general inflation rate. Okay, so they say other operating expenses relate to general administrative and distribution expenses. Due to the expertise that Selena brings, the costs are expected to reduce by 10% per annum over the next three years before leveling off. Okay, so reduce. Okay. Investment income relates to dividends received from Darlings Limited. Darlings Limited on the, is listed on the Nigeria Stock Exchange and operates in several Nigerian states. It headquarters are in, La in Lagos. Darlings is also a baby food manufacturer, but also manufactures dairy products and chocolates. Darlings holds the largest market share in the baby food manufacturing um, in Nigeria and has been in operation longer than all other players. Its PE ratio was 12 and it maintains an average dividend cover of four. Darling has, however, been facing a few challenges such as negative publicity from litigation it faced from a mother who claimed the son died after eating one of their products. This has negatively affected the share price by 20%. In case of the taxation rate in Nigeria is 30%. Working capital from 2016 onwards is expected to grow in line with sales. Um, the general, uh, the general inflation, the general rate of inflation expected to be eight percent for the next five years, and afterwards, an estimated growth rate into perpetuity of five percent in cash flows is expected. Okay, so the exchange rate on one August 2015 was one USD equals three twenty NGN. Akinto's WAC is 20%. Okay, so that is all that I want to read. Just use any other information. Nope. Okay. So that we're going to use to com compile a valuation. So let's look at the required. Um, where is the required now? So you will say prepare a valuation for a Kinto as at 1 August 2016 and advise management whether, <laughs> whether the offer price of $3 million is acceptable. Okay, so we need to do a valuation as at 1 August 2016 and advise management whether the offer price of $3 million is acceptable. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to use um, the free cash flow. Why are we going to use the free cash flow method is because we are acquiring a majority interest. Okay. And they're giving us information to do a cash flow. Okay, so that is what we're going a free cash flow. So that is what we're going to do. So prepare evaluation as at one August 2016 and advise advise management whether the offer of three million dollars is acceptable. Okay, so now we're gonna go into doing that. I'm just gonna open up Excel quickly.
So they wanted 1 August 2016. Okay, so that is the same as 31 July 2016. Okay, so just take note of that. So let me just have a look quickly. What we're going to do, we're going to have details. Okay, should be able to see Excel. So details, then we're going to have year zero. Um, I, think I, I think I saw a five-year period. We'll check that now. Okay, so we're going to have it like that. So year zero, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. Uh, so I'm going to check the required again. So remember what the required said? The required set the following. The required set prepare the valuation for a Kinto as at 1 August 2016. So as at 1 August 2016, that is going to be year zero. Okay, so as at 31 August 2016, that is year zero. So that's important to take note. So that is year zero. So this year is zero. 1 August. 31 July is the same thing. Okay, so 1 August 31 July, 1 August 2016, 31 July 2016 is the same thing. So a year later will be 31 July 2017. A year later will be 31 July 2018. Okay. Okay, we'll I'll check now until which year we need to stop. So remember 1 July, okay, I'm just gonna make it 1 August, but they asked us. So 1, 1 August 31 July is the same thing. Okay, so that whenever they say as at, that is year zero. That's gonna be the um the net present value of your valuation. Okay, so that's gonna be where the value is gonna be at. So we must present value up until this point. So that's important to take note. Okay, so just take note of that. Now, um, I, we, we just need to see, I need to see until which year we need to stop, but we will check that out just now. I, I, um, I didn't pick that up yet. So we will see what we need to do, okay? So what you must know, we need to get to an operating cash flow number. Okay, so we need to get to an operating cash flow number. That's what we need to get to. So I'm just going to give you a typical format. Okay, and then I'm going to show you the, the, the standard format. How are we going to how are we going to use the standard format to um, set up the format relative to this question? And you're going to see the similarities, if not the same. So remember, I'm going to show you the general format because once you have the general format. Then you can use the general format for a free cash flow um, given a particular question. You may have to adjust it slightly given a particular question. Like in this, we can adjust it slightly. But I first want to show you the general format so that you can handle anyone that comes your way. So that you don't that you don't think it's always how we're going to do it now. But there is a general format, and you will adjust that general format to suit the information given to you. Okay. So I'm just gonna switch over here quickly. So what you must know, like we have the details, um, you're gonna have year zero, and then you're gonna have the explicit period. Okay, the explicit period is whatever. Okay, we will see. So I'll, basically what are we gonna do? We're gonna start off with operating profit. Okay, you're gonna start off with operating profit. Now that operating profit is an accounting number. Remember, when it comes to finance, we're not interested in accounting numbers. We are interested in, um, in cash flow numbers. So we need to make adjustments to get to a cash flow number. So what do we do? All we do is we have um, operating profit. Then we add back depreciation. Okay, so we say add back depreciation. The reason why we add back depreciation 
included in here is um, included in there is um, so we have operating profit including operating profit is depreciation actually before we do that we need to first work out the tax on this tax on operating profit okay so the reason why we work out tax on operating profit um, and we leave depreciation in there because it is assumed we only are using as an assumption in the real world this may not be true but just for simplicity purposes um, we assume a depreciation which is the accounting we and this and this and the, and the tax we and is exactly the same so therefore we work out tax on operating profit over here and then we add back depreciation okay so this gives us the correct tax number, but including the operating profit is um, a, a non-cash flow. So what we have to do, we have to add back the non-cash flow to get to a cash number. Okay, so this will give us an operating cash number. What's very important, operating cash. Okay, so operating cash. Okay, whatever you want to call it. Um, so what we need to understand is that we only want operating numbers. We don't want um, we don't want income and expenses. We don't want cash flow relating to non-operating items. So, for example, that warehouse, the rental income on the warehouse is a non-operational income. It relates to an investment. Same with that investment in Nigerian shares. That is an investment. So we don't want those um, cash flows. So that is why we only take operating profit, which is relating to the operations, the main operations of the business. But we need an after tax number. So we say tax on the operating number. Now we're we saying included in this operating number is a non-cash flow. So therefore we add back. Okay. Now, we know in order, so now we have the operating number. What we know though is that we need certain assets to generate this profit. And what, what assets do we need? We need working capital and we need PPE. So what do we do? We will say um, change in working capital. So we bring this in. We need a cash flow for change in working capital without the working capital, without inventory, without debtors, without creditors, we won't have an operations, okay? So that is why a working capital is included in this calculation because it forms part of operations. Then we also, um, we also um, uh, have capital expenditure, what you guys call replacement asset costs, okay? So, so we call this capital expenditure. Capital expenditure refers to the PPE. Think about Coca-Cola. Without Coca-Cola having the machinery, they won't be able to produce Coke. So therefore, the machinery, which is PPE, forms part of the operations. It is required to run the operations. And that is why we bring in capital expenditure. What you guys call it is asset replacement cost, something like that. Okay. Now, this will give us... Now, this will give us um, uh, free cash flow. Okay, so this will give us free cash flow. Okay, so that will give us free cash flow. All of those numbers will give us free cash flow. Okay, now remember, year one to year five is known as your explicit period. The explicit period can be anything. Okay. Generally, in the real world, the, the explicit period should be 10 to 15 years at least. Um, but for our purposes, the, um, the explicit period can be any number of years. We have to look within the scenario to, to determine what is the explicit period. The explicit period is the period where numbers are not constant. So I don't know if you remember me reading where inflation becomes stable and this becomes stable. So whenever something is stable for the foreseeable future, 
from that date onwards, the explicit period ends. So we don't know what it is. I need to go check. I can't remember the date, but basically it can be anything. Okay, so this year refers to the explicit period. But remember, you're not only having a company for five years. We're having a company, we expect to have a company forever and ever. And that is why we bring in something known as the terminal value. Another term for the terminal value is the continuing value. Okay, so just take note of that. Okay, so this is going to give us our, our cash flow. Okay. This is going to give us our um, uh, operating cash flow. Okay, whatever you want to call it, free, I don't know what you want to call it, free cash flow. Okay. Okay. So now what we're going to do, so now when we have our free cash flows over here, including the terminal value, we will then have a discount rate. We will then have a discount rate. This is a, a free cash flow calculation, which is got to do with business, um, which, which, which is relating to your operate your business, your operating cash, your operating income and, and expenses, your operating cash flows. And as a result, what we um what we the discount rate we use is always going to be WAC. Okay, because it relates to the business. And then this is going to give us. Okay, so this is going to give us um, the value of um, value of um, I don't know what they call it. But anyway, value of I'm just of the term now. Free cash flow operations. This is going to be value of operations. Okay, so this is going to give us value of operations. Then what do we do? We add. We add non-operating assets. Okay, so I'm using I'm using one term, non-operating assets, but we will list on non-operating assets. So, for example, in this scenario, it will be all the other assets, all the other um, all the other assets that is not change working capital, that is not capital expenditure. So, for example, the warehouse, the um, the, the investment in that Nigerian company. Um, as well as the non-operating cash and cash equivalents. So every asset on the balance sheet that has a cash flow implication that is not included in working capital, that is not included in capital expenditure, must come over here, non-operating assets, okay? So we add non-operating assets. So in this scenario, I can remember the Nigerian investment. I can remember the warehouse. I can remember this cash and cash equivalent, so we always include the um, cash and cash equivalent that is not part of your operations, okay? So you list the individual non-operating assets. This will give you, this will give you the value of the business, okay? This will give you value of the business, okay? But we don't want the value of the business. We want the value of equity. So what do we do? We say less, um uh value of debt now you list all the debt that have a cash flow impl implication so whatever the debt is and then this will give us um and then remember there can be other types of equity as well like for example less um pref equity because remember we don't want any equity we want the value of ordinary equity so then you list the value of preference equity. Okay, this must also be value, value of, meaning the market value. Okay, so not just any number, it must be the value of. Okay, so then we have the value of the business, but we don't want the value of the business. The value of the business means the value of the assets. We don't want the value of the assets. We don't want the value of the business. We want the value of equity. So then we subtract the value of debt and we don't want the value of any equity. We want the value of ordinary equity. So then we subtract the value of preference equity if there is, I don't think there was in this case. And then this will give you, 
this will give you um, value of equity. Okay, so this will give you value of equity. If, must be very careful, if they ask you for the value of each share, if they ask you for the value of each share, then you must say number of shares. And then you say value of equity divided by value or uh, divided by number of shares. And that can give you value of um, value per share. Okay, so just take note what you want. What's important to take note, this is value of equity at 100%. Like in our scenario, we're not going to count. Um, we, we, we're not acquiring 100%, we're acquiring 80%. So what we will do, they never asked us for value per share. Okay, so we don't have to do this. I'm gonna delete it, I just wanted to show you. So we don't want, um, we are not looking for value per share, uh, nor do we want the 100% equity, we want an 80% equity. So what do we say? Value of, um 80 percent equity so what do we do all we do is we say the value of equity multiplied by 80 percent the value of equity of 100 percent multiplied by 80 percent and that would give us our final answer okay so just take note that is the structure now in this scenario we might not exactly have it like this because they're giving us sales cost of sales and so forth so we may go through all of that but ultimately, we want to get to this line item, free cash flow. Okay, but free cash flow must only take into operating cash flow, working capital, and capital expenditure, as you call it, asset replacement costs. Okay, so any questions at this point before we move on to the actual question? Any questions? Uh, not from me, Fires. Uh, thank you very much uh, for for tell. It was quite insightful. Okay. Other guys, can you just give a thumbs up if there are no questions? I just want to go to the boss quickly, and then we're going to answer this question. I'm just going into the boss. Yes, we can proceed. I have to say he wants to visit uh, the bathroom. He will be back in a minute. Not yet, Jay. Thanks.
Okay, so now we can go in and go in about doing this particular question. Okay, so remember what we're going to do. So we need to get to operating profit. So you, um, you guys might just make sure you're following on your question paper. I hope you have your question paper open with you. So what we're going to do, we're going to um, take down the, um, we're gonna count, we're gonna take down the information given. So we're gonna start off with um, the sales and cost of sales. So what we will do over here, we're gonna have sales and cost of sales. Let me just see what do you guys see quickly. You guys seeing the screen, right? Okay, should be able to see the screen. So we're going to start off with sales. So the reason why we start with sales over here because sales and sales changes, okay? So therefore we're going to start off with sales and then we're going to have cost of sales. Now it's important to take note, we can't use the information. We can't plug in the information from, um, we can't plug in the information from the, from the income statement because that relates to August, 20, that relates to 2016. So we're gonna have to look at the notes to see how to use this information to get to 31 July, 2017 and so forth. Okay, so let's have a look. Okay, so sales of merchandise and cost of sales is note number one. So we're gonna go to note number one and note number one says, revenue will be from the sale of baby food. Revenue is forecast to increase due to the turnaround strategies to be introduced by Selena in real term. Uh, by Selena, in real terms, the revenue is expected to grow at eight percent, while food inflation is expected to be eight percent for the next five years. Thereafter. Nominal growth of 4% is expected. Cost of sales is, cost of sales percent is, is expected to remain unchanged. Okay, so there are, there are two types of increases. Okay, so there are two types of increases. Okay, so just take note, um, generally, generally, so you must find out this from your, um, from your, you must find out this from your lecturers, okay? So generally, the explicit period will be um, five years, which as you can see, for five years, um, only after five years, will there be a constant growth rate of 4%. Now, this is something that is in the academic world and I guess in the real world also. So generally, we would another, another exam would have just stopped over here over at, in, at, 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 at year five. But I see um, your question goes a, year, go, goes a year further. And this is also something that one of our lecturers at UCT also preferred. Okay, but it is, I'll explain this now. So in the add an extra year, your explicit period is this over here. Your explicit period is those five years, right? And then only after year five, everything remains constant. So there's a, obviously there's difference of opinion regarding this, okay? But um, uh, um, from a mathematical point of view, it says that it's more prudent, makes more sense to add an extra year after the explicit period. So explicit period is five years. How do we know it's five years? Because you, if you look at um, point number one, they're telling you after five years, they after a nominal growth rate is of 4% is expected, meaning after five years for the remaining period, um, your growth rate is going to be constant at 4%. 
So therefore your explicit period is five years. So I see what you guys are doing. After your explicit period, you add another year. So I'm gonna do it like that. Um, so like I said, in the textbook that I use from you, that the, the one is you see the lecturer that wrote the textbook, he, um, he also believes that you must go an extra year because of a mathematical issue, right? Um, but what I want you to know in another exam, they may just stop after um, the explicit period. Okay, so you might just maybe find from your lecturers whether you must always add the extra year after the explicit period. Okay, so just take note of that. What I can tell you, if you might just say you out of out of interest, if you must work through <coughs> a cycle exam, right? Cycle must likely stop at this point. Okay, but maybe in another cycle exam, they would add the extra year. So it just depends how that person feels. Okay, so you must um, find out what, um, if you must always go, you must always add the extra year after the explicit period. Like I said, there is a mathematical reason for it. Okay, but usually we'd have stopped at this point and not add the extra year. But because um, some like um, well, what they found out that from a mathematical point of view, it is more accurate to include the extra year. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here at that point. I'm not gonna explain any further on it. Okay, so now we're gonna bring in our sales. Now remember the sales is gonna increase by that 8% and by that 6% relative to what was in 2016. So if we look at 2016, 2016 was, um, where is that now? 2016 was 1420688. So 2016 was 1420688. Okay, so we use that number equal 1420688. But remember, that number is not for, for July 2017. That number relates to um, July 2016. And then they said that they expect a real increase of 6%. And there's also an inflation increase of 8%. So we're going to increase it by the real increase. And we're going to increase it by the inflation increase. Okay, so that is what we're basically going to do. Then after that, Then after that, all we're going to do then all we're going to do, we're going to say the previous year and multiply it by that increase. The real rate multiplied by the inflation rate. Okay, so that's all we're going to do, and we drag it across. We drag it up until the explicit period. We drag it up until the explicit period. Because remember, after the explicit period, we're not increasing by six and by the eight, we're only increasing by the inflation rate, which is now, um, which is now 1.04, which is now 4%. Okay, so just take note of that. Okay, so just take note of that. Okay, so just stop me if you have any questions. If there's no stopping, I'm gonna assume we are happy and then I'm just gonna move on. Okay, now we must work out the, um, so now we're gonna to have to work out the cost of sales. They said in point number one, they told us that cost of sales is gonna remain, the cost of sales percentage is gonna remain the same. So all we can do is work out what cost of sales is. So the cost of sales percentage, um, so remember the cost of sales percentage is, what I can just show you in 2016, cost of sales percentage is um, 12, I mean, cost of sales percentage is 11.26,864. So cost of sales is 11.26, Six, eight sixty four, eight sixty four, 
divided by um, divided by the sales of 1420 860 1420 uh, whatever okay so that is the percentage what you can do if I want to be more you want to be more proper what am I going to do I'm just going to do this here Okay, so basically cost of sales percentage, cost of sales percentage is equal to cost of sales divided by sales. Okay, so all I will just say, cost of sales percentage equal to cost of sales and sales. So cost of sales was 116864 116864 sales was um 1420688 so therefore my percentage is going to be that that divided by Okay, so that is my percentage. So now when we work out cost of sales, all we will do, cost of sales is equal to the negative of that multiplied by the percentage. Okay, so I can just basically drag across. C5, C5, okay. Yeah, I can just say working. Uh, this is basically sales multiplied by working one. Okay, so that is basically it over there. Okay, so that means cost of sales is just the sum of that. I mean, gross profit. Gross profit is just the sum of this. But remember, I don't want gross profit. I want, um, I want operating profit, okay? So we go back to the income statement. There is other operating income. So let's go have a look what is other operating income. So note number two says other, what was that? That was um, other operating income, note number two. So other non-operating income relates to rental income from the warehouse in Abu Ho industrial area. The average yield is 15%, um, okay? So you don't have to include it, but I'm going to include it just for explanational purposes. Okay, so here we're going to have your other income. What was it called now? Other, other, other operating income. Other operating income. So this is going to be zero. You don't have to include it. Eh? You can just leave it out. I'm just going to do this just so you, so you understand what, why I'm doing this. So non-operating income. Therefore, excluded from 
um, free cash flow valuation. Okay, so just so you know. Okay, next we have on the depreciation. Uh, and, yeah. Sorry, but, sorry, Fires, I lost you uh, on that note uh, that you were um, uh, highlighting. Uh, could you kindly go again? Sorry. Where? Uh, non operating income uh, kind of lost you there. So I remember um, the free cash flow, the free cash flow only takes into account operational income. Operational income refers to income that forms part of your normal business. Now, rental is not part of your normal business. So therefore, that is considered non-operational income. It is it's more of an investment income. So um, that is why we exclude it from the free cash flow because the free cash flow is calculating the value of operations. Your operations is your normal business, um, your core business. Your, uh, the renting out of the property is not your core business, so therefore it can't be included in the valuation. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Okay. Now we're going to have depreciation and amortization. Okay, so let's just have a look. So depreciation amortization, note number three. So let's go have a look at note number three. So they say depreciation has been calculated based on the current depreciation policy determined by IA16 and IA38. Depreciation to sales ratio is expected to remain constant over the forecast period. Management expects depreciation and amortization to equal asset replacement costs. Okay. So remember, um, so remember, depreciation is a non cash flow. Um, depreciation is a non cash flow. So therefore, it will be included as zero. We don't bring it in. Okay, so I see you guys don't take the tax implications, so I'm not sure why. So, but other than that, ignoring the tax flow implication, it is correct to have depreciation as zero because depreciation is a non cash flow. So, therefore, we do not take it into account. Because remember, we're trying to get to a cash flow from operations. We're trying to get to a cash flow from operations. Okay, so just take note of that. Next, we have, um, what was it? Now? Next, we have, I just need to go to the income statement. We have operating leases. So we can have a look at operating leases when it comes to um, point note number four. So note number four says the following. Operating leases relates to lease of storage warehouses in Borno and Inugu states. The lease company belongs to the current shareholders and the lease costs are 20% below the market rates. The lease expires in two years time and will likely be renewed at market rates. The contract provides for lease escalations at the current general inflation rate. Okay, so the general inflation rate, um, the general inflation rate is 8% for the next five years, and then 5% um, after that, and afterwards an estimated growth in the yeah, okay. Okay, so now what we're going to do, so what's important to take note, we're gonna, um, what's important to take note, we're gonna grow this by 8% for the next five years, okay. But now you might just take some important note over here. So you have operating lease. So remember, there's two years remaining on the contract. Okay, so there's two years remaining on the contract. So we don't have to take market value. 
we can take the value based on the contract. Okay, so that's important to take note. We don't have to take market value because the, the contract still has two years, so we can pay the below market rate. So all we're going to do is the following. We're going to take 2016's number and grow it by the inflation rate. So 2016's number is 21655. So 2016's number is 21655. 21655, and we're going to grow it by the normal, the general inflation rate. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to grow it by the general inflation rate. Okay, so did I take the right number? Operating leases, sorry, 35034. 35034, sorry, I took the wrong number. Just double check that I take the right numbers. So 35034, that is, the, that is 2016's um, number. Okay, and then we grow it by 8%, the general inflation rate. Okay, now, now you must take note that from, of, from 2019 onwards, the lease expires and the lease is going to be renewed. Okay, so the lease expired and the lease needs to be renewed. When the lease is renewed, because it's now, um, um, it's, for, it's not for the current shareholders, it's for other owners, they're gonna charge market related rates. So now we have to work out the market related rate. Remember the market related rate well, it was 20% um, below market related rate. So what we're going to do, we just need to increase it. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to say that that number multiplied by 1.08. Okay, so that is increasing it for general inflation. But this increase is still below market. So what do we do? We just divide it by 80%. Okay, so what do we do? We just divide it by 80%. So we're going to say divide by 0 0.8, because remember, it is 20% below market value. So that means this number is equal to 80% of market value. So to gross it up for 100%, we just divide by 0 0.8. So that's very, very important to take note of that. But this is just simply mathematics, okay? So remember, I mean, yeah, so this is simply math mathematics. It's more important to understand why we're doing it, and then you can figure out how to do it. It's first important to understand why you are doing something before trying to figure out how to do it. Okay, so that's important. Because even if you know how to do it, if you don't know why, you will get it wrong in another question, because it's not going to be the same in another question. So it's very important to make sure you know why you're doing something. Then you figure out how to do it. Okay, so now because this number is now normal market rate, we can just grow it by the general inflation rate of 1.08. Equal that times 1.08. And over there, 1.08. Now remember over here, this is not, this is not this is um, after the explicit period. So I just want to highlight this so we don't forget. Okay, so remember that is after the explicit period. So after the explicit period, this is going, not going to be 1.08, but rather it's going to be 1.05. Okay. Okay, so that was that. The next one is operating expenses. Operating expenses is in note number five. Hi, Faiz. Yes. Uh, confirm after the explicit period is 1.05. Yes. It's, it's supposed to be 1.04. No. I think it's 1.05. Go look at, go look at um, 
go look at note number nine. So number nine. The one point, the 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 the, the zero point four, the four percent that is specifically relating to revenue. Note number nine is giving you the general. Mm -hmm. Okay, very important. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. All right. Happy. Yes. Okay. Yes, guys. Okay, so just be aware. Okay, so they so they use the word general. Okay, now we're going to do operating expenditure. So operating expenditure, note number, I think it was note number, note number five. So other operating expenses related to general admin and distribution expenses due to the expertise that Selena brings, these costs are expected to be reduced by 10% per annum over the next three years before leveling off. Okay, so 10%. Is they're going to reduce it by 10%. So all we're going to do, we take 2016's number. Twenty sixteen's number is 194-308. It is... 194 308. They're going to reduce it by 10%. So, therefore, this number is going to be 90% of that 90%, which is being reduced by 10%. Then again, it's going to be that number times 90%, which is being reduced by 10%. Then again, it's going to be that number multiplied by 90% because it's being reduced by 90%. But then thereafter, after year three, it is gonna remain the same. So then it is just gonna equal that. Okay. Okay, and then this is gonna give us now our cash profit before tax. Okay, so remember if you go to the, um, so if you go to the, what you call it, there's investment income and there's finance costs. Investment income is, if it, uh, it's non-operating, so therefore we don't include it. Finance costs, non-operating, therefore we don't include it, okay? Because the note number six relates to the investment in darling. Investment in darling is not part of your core business. So therefore, we don't include it in the free cash flow. Okay, so I just want, I'm just quickly going to include it um, so that you get a clear picture. Okay, so um, what I'm going to highlight over here in, I'm going to highlight it in yellow. So it means in your answer, in your exam, you don't have to include it. Okay. So this was investment income and um, finance charges. So these two, we don't include because it is not operating income, okay? A finance non-operating expense. So remember, therefore, we we only we only interested in operational income in operational expenses. When we say operational, we're referring to the core business. Anything that is non-core, it is for 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 free cash flow considered non-operating. Okay, so very important. So everything highlighted in yellow. You don't have to include it in your exam, but because it's a tutorial to make you understand, I'm including it just so that you know going forward, okay? So this would be your operating um, cash flow before tax, okay? Now we're gonna bring in tax. Okay, we're just first gonna add this up. I made a mistake over here.
Okay, now we're gonna have tax on operating profit. So remember 30%, so simply gonna be negative that number multiplied by 30%. Okay. Then we must bring in working capital and um, and asset replacement costs. So working capital, so we're gonna say changes in working capital. And I'm gonna call it what you guys call it, asset replacement costs, okay? Also known as a capital expenditure. Asset replacement costs. Okay, so let's go have a look what they said about asset replacement costs and let's go have a look what they said about working capital. So working capital from 2016 onwards is expected to grow in line with sales. So working capital is expected to grow in line with sales. So we need to have a look what happened to sales and then we can work out what happens to working capital, okay? So all we need to do is identify what happened to, um, to sales and the, uh, what happened to working capital. And then these numbers will grow in line with sales, okay? So just take note of that. So I'm gonna give you the full way of how to do this calculation. So I'm gonna go to working two, Okay, so the way we do this is as follows. So working two, we're gonna have details. I'm a little bit longer, but this is why you must think through it. Here's zero, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, and year six. Okay, so that's how we're gonna do it. Then we're going to have your working capital, you go to your balance sheet, go to current assets, current liabilities. Go to your balance sheet, go to current assets, go to current liabilities. So you take inventory and debtors. Okay, I'm not gonna write the full words. Okay, because I'm gonna sit here forever. So inventory and trade receivables. I'm just gonna call it debtors, okay? So inventory, debtors, and then cash and cash equivalents. Okay, I'm gonna to speak to cash and cash equivalents now. Cash and um, cash equivalents. Okay, I'm just gonna put this here, trade, and other receivables, okay? Okay, so this here is assets and we're going to have, um, what was it called? So under, we have creditors and provisions. So we have creditors and provisions, okay? So they're calling it creditors and provisions, okay? Okay, so here we're gonna have our working capital. Remember, we don't work, we don't want working capital, we want change in working capital. Okay, so there we go. Now this is gonna be the answer we are looking for. Now we just plug in the numbers. Okay, so 2016 inventory was so 2016. Inventory was 17629. 17629. Okay. Inventory was 17629. Um, <clears throat> um, 
the next one was sorry. the next one was train other receivables 62716 62716 okay so cashing cash equivalent must be very careful okay so cashing cash equivalents can have an operational amount and a non-operational amount. If they don't tell you anything, you assume none of it forms part of operations. So they never told us anything about cash and cash equivalents. So we assume none of those amounts um, is used for operations. Therefore, the full amount is used as a non-core asset. So therefore, we're going to include it in as zero. But in another exam, in another question, sorry, they could say, Five percent of cash and cash equivalents is two percent of revenue. Then that means you must only include over here two percent of revenue, and the difference would be um, the difference would be non-core. So just take note of that. Because I said nothing, we assume nothing is part of operations. Okay, so that is two three three. Then we go. We have a look at creditors. Where's creditors? Two one nine one eighty eight. 219188. So working capital would be that minus that. Okay, so working capital, I'm going to check quickly. Um, so creditors, inventory, got everything. Okay. Okay, taxation, creditors, taxation. Okay, um, I see you guys include all creditors. Okay, so we'll just include all creditors. Um, plus tax, you generally don't include tax, but okay, we'll include it. Um, so all creditors. How much was creditors now? Um, 12033. 12033. Okay, so there we go. Now we have all our working capital. Okay, so now we have our total working capital. Now remember, we don't want total working capital, but we need total working capital. So now they said working capital grows like in the same way revenue grows. How did the revenue grow? Revenue grew by 1.06. Sorry? 1.06 by 1.08. 1.06 multiplied by 1.08. Okay, so that's how that grew. So all the way up until there, and then it grows by 1.04. That multiplied by 1.04 in the exact same way as revenue. Now, we don't want working. This is the balance of working capital. We don't want the balance of working capital. Very, very important. Eh? We don't want the balance of working capital. We want the change or the movement in working capital. So all we say, last year minus this year. Last year minus this year. So that is what we're going to spend every, that is what we're going to spend each, that is what we're going to spend every year. Okay, so what we go, we go plug it in. So now we go to um, our answer and we go to working capital and I just say equal to working two. And then there we go. There we go. Okay, so that is change in working capital. Now let's do asset replacement. Asset replacement was explained to us under the depreciation note. Depreciation was note number three. 
So deeply, um, so as the replacement was, was explained under note number three, they say management expects depreciation and amortization to equal asset replacement costs. And they say depreciation to sales ratio is expected to remain the same. Okay, so, so remember, we're gonna have to work out the depreciation to sales ratio. So all I'm going to do, I'm gonna put in here working three, So just for, I'm just gonna do this for explanational purposes. So asset replacement cost equals depreciation. Okay, so this is just for explanational purposes that, that, that are out there. Now we need to work out um, the depreciation ratio, okay? So depreciation, to sales ratio. So using the 2016 year, using the 2016 year, the ratio is depreciation in 2016 was, was 21,655, 21,655, the sales was 14,20,688. Okay, so the depreciation ratio is that amount over there. Okay, so that means as the replacement cost is going to be sales, um, is going to be sales times the depreciation to sales ratio. So this over here, as the replacement is going to be sales times working three, working three is the, um, the ratio. Okay, so this is equal to sales multiplied by the depreciation to sales ratio. Can you repeat this one, please? Sure. Okay, so they are saying that the asset replacement cost equals depreciation. So if we can work out what is depreciation, we will be able to work out what is the asset replacement cost. So the question is, how do we work out depreciation? They say depreciation is, um, the depreciation to sales ratio will remain the same. So if we go to 2016, we can work out what is the depreciation to sales ratio. We say depreciation, divided by sales. And that gave us that, um, whatever it was, then that gave us a 0 0.15. So now you add the depreciation to sales ratio, you get depreciation every year. We take the depreciation to sales ratio and multiply it by the sales of each year, and that will give you your depreciation. Okay, no, that's fine. Okay. Okay. So now we can work out, now we'll get our answer. Okay, so this is going to be, cash flow from operations. Okay, then we're gonna work out terminal value. Another word for terminal value is the continuing value. Terminal value. And then this will give us this will give us free cash flow from operations. Okay. Terminal value, you know, work out working for. I'm going to say equal. OK, 
Okay, so there we go. Now we can work out the terminal value. Okay, so go, let's go have a look how to work out the terminal value. The terminal value or the continuing value is equal to free cash flow, free cash flow multiplied by one plus G divided by WAC minus G. Okay, so that is that. So the question is, what is free cash flow? Free cash flow is the last free cash flow. So the latest free cash flow in this question was cash flow six. Okay, so just take note of that. So the last free cash flow is cash flow six. So to get to the terminal value, I'm going to need the last cash flow, which is cash flow six. I'm going to need to know G. And I'm going to need to know WAC. We know what is G or WAC. WAC is the 20%. G is going to be the, um, G is the 5%, which is given in note number um, nine. Okay, so G is at the inflation rate that's going to grow forever and ever. Okay, let me just quickly go check. So G is the growth rate into the foreseeable future. G is the growth rate into the foreseeable future which is that gonna be that, so there you see afterwards an estimated growth into perpetuity of 5% in cash flows is expected. Okay, so that is why I use that. Okay, so now we can, free cash flow is the last cash flow in, in our calculation, which is the 229698. Okay, so now to work out terminal value, just plug in what we have over there. It is equal to open bracket free cash flow six multiplied by open bracket one plus the growth rate close bracket close bracket divided by open bracket whack which is 20 minus the growth rate so therefore, my terminal value is whatever this answer is. Okay, so that's why I write out this formula over here so you can see what you need to do. Free cash flow refers to the last free cash flow, which in this case was, it was year six. Then you grow it by the growth rate and then divide it by WAC minus the growth rate. Okay, so we got to one, six, whatever that is. So all I do is I go plug this in over here, one, six. So my cash flow from operation, my free cash flow from operations is this, okay? But now remember, I don't want future cash flows. I want a present value. So then I'm going to have discount rate and my discount rate is WAC. We're going to say it is 20% because that is what WAC is. So this is going to give me the value of operations. Okay, so it's going to give me value from operations. So all I'm going to use, I'm going to use the NPV formula over here. So I'm going to say NPV, open bracket. They want the rate. Then they want the cash flows. So my value is that. Okay, but now I'm going to need to add everything up.
Let me just check how they calculated the, the terminal value. We just find out why they didn't grow it. Okay, so they, they should have grown it. So just be aware of that. Okay, and then we're going to have the warehouse, the investments, and the cash and cash equivalent. So now we're going to add our assets. So we can add our assets. So remember, add non core assets, non core assets. So if we go to the balance sheet, so let's go to the balance sheet. Go to the balance sheet so you can see how I get my non core assets. So if I go to my balance sheet, I already used PPE. Okay, so PPE have already been taken into account. Then we have investment property, we have investment, and we have deferred tax assets. Remember, deferred tax asset is a non cash flow. So therefore, we exclude that. So it's just investment property and investment. Okay, so we go to investment property. So we're going to say investment property. We're going to say investment. Then if we go back, then you can see there is inventories we took into account. There's trade and other receivables. We took that into account in working capital. Then there's cash and cash equivalents. We didn't take cash and cash equivalent into account. So we will write that down. Cash and cash equivalents. cash and cash equivalents. You take the number as is, 88, 88, um, 88 232, 88, If you had a number in your working capital, then this cash and cash equivalents will be this number minus the number included in your working capital. Okay, so that's very important. Okay, so there we have that. This will give us this will give us value of business. But we don't want value of business. Okay, we don't want value of business. We need to get the value of equity. So therefore we need to um we need to um we need to put Add and um, subtract the value of debt. Okay, so value of business. I yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, I just want you to 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 go through again that point that you mentioned about working capital. Uh, you are. Yeah. I, I, I think I have lost. I have lost that point. Um, I've missed that point. Okay, well, uh, you are saying now. if we have got working capital in in year zero. Yeah. No. 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 If if working capital can see here, cash cash equivalence is zero. Let's say we had cash 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 equivalence of one thousand. Okay, just let's say. Oh. Then okay. when you come okay. over here, when you come over here, you must take that full number. Take that full number, and you subtract the one thousand. Okay, but because there's nothing, okay. there's nothing to subtract. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so do we, are we gonna have value of debt? Once we have value of debt, and then we will have the value of equity. Okay, then we're gonna have the value of equity. So now this will be, there's no, okay, we just also just say less, value of pref shares there's nothing in this case i'm just to make it zero i'm just giving you the full picture okay don't have to put in value of preference shares if there's nothing okay and this will give us value of equity Will give us value of equity 100%. Okay. We will now have to work out the value of, of those assets. Okay. So we're going to have to work out um, the value of the loan. We're going to have to work out. And they're not telling us how to work out the value of the loan. So you can take the value of the loan as is. 
So because there's no, we, we, there's no way to work out the value of the loan, so we're going to take the value of the loan as is 53,794. So there's, there's no information to work out the value of the loan. If there's no information to work out the value of debt, then you assume the balance sheet amount is the market value. Okay, so 53,794. Okay. So if there's no way to work out the value, then you assume that the value um, is the same as the balance sheet amount. Okay. Now we must work out the value of um, investment property, and we need to work out the value of um, the investment. Okay, so we can go for the um for the let me see now for the investment property we can go to note number two. So they're telling you that um, other non-operating rental income from the various from the warehouse in a bow industrial area, which are kin to rents, the rental average the average rental yield in the area is fifteen percent. Okay, so all we can do is just use that. So I'll show you how to use that now. Um, so because, because the rental income is earned into perpetuity, perpetuity, we use the perpetuity formula, formula to calculate the value. Okay, so the perpetuity formula says the perpetuity formula says value equals um, income divided by or payment. Okay, so income or payment divided by I. So income or payment divided by the um, the market rate. Okay, so divided by market rate. So I'm going to say income, we're going to say payment after tax divided by the market rate. Okay. So note number two says the where is that now the average no yield yes yeah um I was kicked out a bit uh, uh think network issue um how do you detail, how do you know that uh, the rental is end into perpetuity because they're not telling you there's a there's a they don't tell you there's a specific period so you can only assume it's into perpetuity. Okay, 
because they're not All going right. to give you a specified period. So you can only assume it is perpetuity. Okay. So you can either say value equals value of payment of the tax divided by market rate of the tax, or you can just say payment divided by market rate. Doesn't matter. Okay, so I was going to say or or value equals um, payment divided by market rate. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, so it can work both ways. So we can see now. Should give us the same answer. We'll just check quickly. Just check. Um, payment and then market rate. So they told us it is 15%. Okay. And over here, if it's after tax, it's going to be 15% times 0 0.7. Okay. Over there, it was 16,200. If it's after tax, it will be 16,200 times um, times 0 0.7. Okay, so you can just have a look at um, our numbers. So we just say payment divided by that. Should give us the same answer. Yeah, should give the same answer. So it doesn't matter which one, okay? So I just wanted to show you they can do it both ways. Okay, so, um, and there is only for perpetuity. Okay, there's only for perpetuity. Okay, and then we must do now the investment. We now have to do the investment. Okay, so now we can do the investment. Um, investment, we're gonna use a PE formula. So now we're gonna look at note number six. So let's go read at note number six. So note number six says the following. They say investment income relates to dividends received from Darlings Limited. Darlings Limited is listed on the Nigeria Stock Exchange and operates in several Nigerian states. It headquarters are in Lagos. Darlings is also a baby food manufacturer but also manufactures dairy products and chocolates. Darlings holds the largest market share in the baby food manufacturing in Nigeria and has been in operation longer than all other players. Its PE ratio was 12 and it maintains an average dividend cover of four. Darling has, however, been facing a few challenges. Okay, Eva. So now what we're going to have to do is use the PE formula to work out what is its value, okay? So if we use the PE valuation, we'll be able to work out what is its value.
So working six, we're going to use the PE formula, the, 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 the PE evaluation method, because that's what you can see we need to do. So to work out the value using the PE multiple, we're going to say value equals PE, PE multiple multiplied by earnings. Okay, so multiplied by earnings. So that means to get value, we need the PE multiple and we need earnings. Okay, so we just take the PE as is, that was given. Now we need to work out earnings. Okay, so now we need to work out earnings. The question is, how are we going to get earnings? We never gave us earnings. But they did give us, I'm going to tell you now what they gave us. They did give us dividend cover and they did give, so they gave us dividend cover and we know the dividends. Okay, so remember dividend cover is calculated as follows. I'll show you now. So if we go to note number six, what you can see, the PE multiple is given. And what they also gave us is a dividend cover. So the question is, so we know, what you must understand is, we know to get the, we want the value of that investment. So we need to be able to calculate that value of the investment somehow. Given the scenario, it is clear that we need to calculate the value using the PE multiple valuation method. So the PE multiple valuation method says value equals PE times earnings. We have PE, but we don't have earnings. Now also in that scenario, they're giving us a dividend cover. So we know we need earnings. So the question is, how can we calculate it? What well, is not clear how to calculate it, but what do we know? That they gave us a dividend cover. So what you must do, run through your mind, what just on the side, in your mind. So I'm, this is me thinking in my mind. Dividend cover, dividend cover equals um, earnings divided by earnings divided by dividends. Okay, earnings divided by dividends. I know I have dividend cover. I, I need earnings. The question is, do I have dividends? And the answer is yes, I do have dividends. Because remember, they told me in note number six that the investment income relates to dividends. So that means I do have dividends. So I have dividend cover, I have earnings. So therefore to rearrange this equation, earnings equals dividend cover times dividends. So now I can work out earnings. So all I do is I take this formula and that was, that's how you must think, right? So that is how you have to think. So working seven. So the, the way I was thinking through this is I know I need to work out the value of the investment. And I go to note number six. Note number six gives me information relating to PE multiple. By having the information relating to PE multiple, I know I have to work out the value of the investment using the PE multiple formula. So now I go write down the formula. Value equals the value to um, the way to calculate the value of an investment using the PE multiple. He's saying PE multiple times earnings. Now I'm saying, okay, PE multiple is given, earnings is not given. So the next question I ask myself can I calculate earnings? And it's not exactly clear, but I look around as to what I was given. 
So I can clearly see there's a dividend cover. So what I then run through my mind is I ask myself, how do we calculate dividend cover? So then I'm like, okay, dividend cover is earnings divided by dividends. So there that earnings come in. So I'm like, okay, I'm given dividend cover. I want earnings. So that means I need to see if, if dividends was given. And dividends was given because in the first sentence in note number six, they're telling us that investment income relates to dividends. Then I'm like, okay, cool. That means I can work out earnings by rearranging the formula. And that's basically how you need to think. The way you're going to get there is by doing a few questions, but not trying to do as many questions as possible, but doing questions and thinking about what is given, what is not given, and how can you calculate what you need um, based on the information that is given. And that is what's going to come with practice, but not necessarily running through 100 questions, but practice as in doing questions with deep understanding. Okay, so to get earnings, I'm going to need dividend cover. I'm going to need dividend cover. Dividend cover was given, and I have dividends. Dividends was also given. Okay, so I do that. Dividend cover was given to me as four. Dividends, I go, uh, I go to the income statement, investment income. I go to the income statement, investment income, and I see 17.28. So I go there, 17.28. So therefore, my earnings is equal to is equal to that multiplied by that so there's my earnings so i'll just say that's my earnings and i'll tell them i they can go look at working seven my value is equal to my value is equal to that multiplied by that, which is 82. So now I can say that equals working six. So now I can say value of the firm is all of value of the business, value of the firm is that. So the value of 100% equity is that. But I don't want, I want 80% value of 80% is equal to that multiplied by Okay, this is Nigerian, so value of 80% USD is going to be equal to that divided by 320. Okay, um, of a price of a price is equal to three million. One, two, three. I'm gonna divide it by a thousand because that's in the end thousands. So there we can see value 
exceeds us, therefore offer should be accepted by Selena. Okay, so that's basically how I would have done it. Okay. So if I use the 80%, what did you do to come up with the 30, 30, 36? Sorry? Uh, the value of 80% in US dollar. Yeah. Okay, you just divided by 320. Yes, yes. Okay, I see your numbers is slightly different, but you can see where the difference came in. Okay, you can just check where I have a difference in number. Mm, I think on the interest on the tax rate you are using. Tax rate. Mm. Yeah, but okay, you guys can work with that. Then you can let me know. I think you are using thirty percent. Yeah. As we there. use, um, yeah, we use uh, 30, what to call 20, 25% or 24.5. Uh, but, but the question is 30%. Yeah, the question is 30%. Oh, well, the question is 30. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you can just check. Um, I think you can. it could, it could uh, yeah, I think it could also be the issue um, at the calculation of the terminal value that you said. They didn't grow the um, um the right, yeah. Sorry. They didn't grow yes, they didn't grow the right. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, so I think they were they could have yeah, they must have uh, got something wrong there because I'm sure they were they they're supposed to grow that. Uh that yeah, so this is a problem. This is the problem with the with the terminal value. We just see what did I use quickly. So they made a fundamental mistake in the terminal value, right? They made two fundamental mistakes. Number one, they, um, they never grow it. And number two, they didn't present value it. Okay, so they need to present value the, the terminal value. So you can see they're using a number in year six, yet they're putting that, num that, that answer into year zero. In order to put an answer into year zero, they need to first present value it. So um, yeah. if you look at mine, let me show you. This is a question that comes up often in, um, in a psycho exam. So actually they're doing something not right. This is a question that comes up often in a psycho exam. So oh, what's happening here now? Oh, I don't know what you call it. So if you look at my, here's my terminal value over there, right? Then a present, I'm present, I'm present valuing these numbers to get to a present value. So that number 1.6 is present valued all the way backwards to year zero to get that's included in there. All they did was they took that number and plugged it in over here, which is fundamentally incorrect. Do you know how that exact question we get in a psycho exam to identify spot the error? So that is a that is a, a typical mistake that gets made. The second mistake is they took that number as is and they didn't grow it. You need to grow it. Okay, so there's two mistakes in that, um, that thing. And then also what they made a mistake in over here is in the investment property in the yeah, investment property. So for example, in the investment property, they um, said 1600, they took that, they said 1600 times 0 0.7 but then they divide it by the market rate of 15%. If you take an after tax number for payment, your market rate must also be after tax. So at this point in time, they're taking a payment after tax and they're taking a market rate before tax. It's apples with bananas. It's not apples with apples. So that's another mistake, okay? But you might just ask them why wow. they're doing that, okay? okay. That, is okay. The, that is a question that we would get in an exam and then ask us, spot the error. So that is what I know, is I, 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 I teach that to my students to spot those type of errors. So that terminal value is a typical question that you would get in, in um, your NISA would get 
a UCT student or a cycle exam, because that's a common error that gets made that they don't do those present values. <coughs> you might just bring it across to your lectures and ask mm -hmm. them why. Okay. 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 That's all from my side. Is there any other questions from your guys' side? I'll upload this by tomorrow. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Fires. Uh, no question for me. Um, uh, quite an insight. For me only on, on cost, I think I know there's some um, one figure that we didn't um, do inflation rate. I know the way we say the 10% reduced. Yes. Were we not supposed to? Or the expense. Yeah. To Never pay said the... to grow it by inflation. So therefore we didn't grow it by inflation. Okay. No, that's fine. Okay. Thanks. Okay, guys. I'll see you guys on Sunday. I'll, I'll upload this by tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you, Faiz. Confirm okay. we, we we have to send another cash flow question. Is that uh, sorry? Another valuation question. Yeah, but there's no other one to work through for Sunday. Yes. So you can decide. Just All right. Thank you. Okay, cool. Bye bye. All right. Thank you very very much. Pleasure. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Hope you enjoy the class. Bye bye. Bye.